Some people have asked me, why in the world are we trying to preserve this rabbit? And if you're out in the landscape, you just see a little brown rabbit. So why save New England cottontail? And you know, there are really a, a variety of reasons, I think. And the way I, I picture it is a, is a tapestry, a natural tapestry, it's a beautiful tapestry. And when we eliminate a species, we're taking a thread out of that tapestry and we're weakening the tapestry with every thread that we take out of it. We're trying to do everything we can right now to keep it off the endangered species list. So if you, you know, if you lose things like cottontails, then there's gonna be other impacts to other species. We have two rabbits, cottontails, in Rhode Island, and the New England cottontail is a native species that has been here for well over 10,000 years. And the eastern cottontail is a species that was brought in by hunt clubs during the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Hundreds of thousands of eastern cottontails were brought into New England and released. Well. We're not sure of all the reasons why, but perhaps it's competition. There are a variety of reasons why it could have happened, but New England cottontail had been on the decline. And probably about 20 years ago, a lot of us who are biologists started noticing that the New England was severely starting to decline. And we started uh, doing a little bit of research on that. And there was a census um, on cottontails that was done in the early 2000s that indicated that New England had been reduced about 80% throughout its range. And that precipitated a major concern by biologists, managers, natural resources people throughout New England. And a process was begun to get the New England cottontail listed as an endangered species. Uh, to date, it has become what's known as a candidate species for listing. It's not an endangered species as of yet, but it's a candidate for listing. And that's where we're at right now. As uh, biologists throughout New England, what we're trying to do is gain information and then manage the New England cottontail so that it doesn't become an endangered species. We don't want it to become an endangered species. We want to bring it back from the brink right now and make it more numerous throughout New England. So to do that, there's been a concerted effort on the parts of scientists, managers, even zoo people to bring this animal back. Now, a lot of different players. People at the universities, uh, including University of New Hampshire, University of Rhode Island, several other universities have been doing research that supports our knowledge base for management of this species. In addition to that, we've had uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that has been monitoring the species uh, through trapping and through fecal pellet analysis. Um, We've also started the captive breeding program in cooperation with the Roger Williams Park Zoo. We've been taking rabbits from Connecticut and other parts of New England and bringing them into the zoo where uh, they are bred. And then those animals, the young animals, are brought to a holding pen. And uh, that is at uh, Ninigrit uh, Wildlife Refuge here in Rhode Island. They are released into the pen. They're allowed to stay there for a certain number of days until they get old enough and get used to uh, the natural environment. And then they're released onto Patients Island in Rhode Island, again, one of those breeding colonies that we're trying to create. Eventually, what we want to do is create good habitat on the mainland, uh, hopefully habitat that is in a location where there are few or no eastern cottontails, and allow the New England cottontail to come back in those habitats, increase populations. There are only about five um, major locations where New England cottontail are still extant, and all the other areas are devoid of New England cottontail. So our hope is to create habitat for New England cottontail, bring them back, and release them into those habitats and have uh, active, viable populations at some point in the future. I am a research associate with the program. Um, I finished my master's last spring working on this project. Um, so I've been coordinating our survey efforts for the past four years, but my project was focused on the habitat. This so is the Tower Hill site. 
Um, this is our fourth year surveying this site. Um, we keep coming back every year because of the first field season, which was in 2010, we actually collected our only New England cottontail sample um, from this location. So we've been coming back just to verify that we still have them here and try and get an idea of how many are living up here. All right, so we usually do our surveys um, after snowfall because it makes looking for these um, teeny fecal pellets a lot easier when you have a white background. Um, <clears throat> so we start just kind of thinking like a rabbit and looking in areas where there's a lot of dense vegetation because that's where you're most likely going to find evidence of rabbits. This is actually a perfect example. So in my project I was comparing New England cottontail habitat with eastern cottontail habitat. And I actually had to do that in Connecticut since we don't really have a lot of New Englands to work with here in Rhode Island. Um, but what I found was they were typically in areas with um, high shrub cover. So you see all these um, viney shrubs here that are pretty tall. Yeah. Um, so they like that dense vegetation. But they also seem to be in areas where there's more tree cover um, than where the eastern cottontails are. So this is kind of a perfect example of what I was noticing with my research. Oh, okay. So all you do is open up the tube and you take your tongue depressor and you just scoop it in. So now once we've collected these samples, um, we're gonna have to keep them in a freezer. Uh, we want the pellets to stay cold and dry because um, warmth and water will actually degrade the DNA that's on the outside of the pellet. So that's why we have that silica in there to keep it dry. Um, and then we'll just keep it in a freezer until we can process the samples and find out which species it came from. My name is TJ McGreevy, and I'm the director of the Regional Conservation Genetics Laboratory here at the University of Rhode Island. This is a uh, fecal pellet from the animal, and as the pellet passes through that, their digestive system, cells end up sloughing off on the exterior of the cell. And so what we do when we get these samples in is we go through a process to be able to extract the DNA out of the cells on the exterior of the pellet. So the first part of the extraction process is the manual setup. But after that, we have the capacity to run 96 samples at one time. And to do that, we have a protocol that the robot runs. And what this does is the manual steps that you would normally do, but it does it all automated. In the end, what you end up with is pure DNA. So then you can do a sequencing or other kind of genetic analyses on it. So right now we're sterilizing everything under the hood with a UV light. So we let that run for 10 minutes and pretty much just crisps up any DNA that might be floating around so that we know that everything's sterile. So I'm just adding um, different things into what's called a master mix. And then I'm going to add that master mix uh, to all of my samples there and then add the DNA. And now I'm adding DNA that was extracted using the technique you just saw to those tubes. So I just did the PCR setup. So after it's set up, it goes into a thermal cycler, and that's when the chain reaction actually happens, and that's where all the DNA actually gets amplified. In order to see whether or not the DNA actually amplified, we run it through uh, what's called gel electrophoresis, and that separates the DNA based on size and shape. Um, and then we can see, based on the banding pattern, whether or not our PCR actually worked. Yeah, my name is uh, Lou Parati. I'm the director for conservation programs for the zoo. Um, so it's pretty much my job to use the resources of the zoo, whether it be facilities, staff, um, dollars, um, whatever it takes, whatever those resources are, to make sure that we're contributing our 150% to the survival of wildlife and the wild places that they live in. A, a big part of what our zoo does and two-thirds of our mission is conservation and education. And uh, we have been partnering with, uh, you know, state and federal wildlife agencies for years um, on different projects. Um, zoos, of course, can certainly aid in these kinds of conservation initiatives by, you know, providing space, facilities, and husbandry expertise to be able to rear large numbers of a certain species for any kind of conservation or reintroduction initiatives. 
We originally started with a pilot project in 2010 just to see if the rabbit would do well in a captive setting, mm. um, do well in lab, you know, rabbit lab type caging. Um, so we started in 2010 with six founder rabbits uh, that we received from uh, the Connecticut um, folks. Um, they brought us six animals and uh, we just uh, tried to keep them alive, healthy and happy. Um, and then once we knew that they were doing well, and you know we would gauge that success by you know weighing them, making sure they're gaining weight, they're not losing weight. Um, they all did extremely well. Um, we attempted some breeding and uh, had had some success at breeding. So we decided at that point that we would ramp up, and bring in more founders, and, and try to produce as many young as we could uh, in the, the breeding season of the rabbit. Well, once they're weaned from mom, they go down to uh, Nitty Grit National Wildlife Refuge here. Um, where we have an acre uh, predator-proof pen where the young can go in there, um, you know, stop the forage on wild foods, gives them an opportunity to grow up large enough where they can be fitted with a radio collar. So once they do go to the release site, which uh, in Rhode Island now they've been, we've been releasing rabbits on Patience Island here, um, and that's uh, monitored by the uh, Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. Um, all the rabbits out there have been collared and um, and continue to seem to be doing well out there. But I like to, you know, look at nature like a bicycle wheel. And, you know, you got a brand new bicycle wheel and it has all these spokes in it. It so runs nice and true. And you can pluck one or two spokes out of that wheel and you still probably can ride your bike. But you take one or two more out and that wheel is going to start to wobble. You take one or too many out and the wheel's going to collapse. I don't know about you, but I want all the spokes in my wheel. And the New England cottontail and all these other species we work with are one of those spokes in that wheel. And I don't think it's up to us to pick and choose which is more important or where we should put our resources into one, where we shouldn't into another. I think we should, uh, we owe it to Mother Earth to make sure that it's left at least the same way, if not better, than it was left to us. Well, hi, my name is Kim Moore, and I am a keeper here at the Roger Williams Park Zoo. Uh, I take care of the conservation rabbits along with some of the other keepers here. So part of my job as the keeper is just to take care of these rabbits. So we do basics every day and then on top of that we do other projects as we go. This is number 24. She was born here at the zoo. She is actually a really good mama. She gave us, I think our largest litter from her was eight babies. So that's pretty good from, for, for a rabbit. But like I was showing you before, She's a little bit more desensitized to humans, but um, generally when you clean in here, they move away. <laughs> and we just make sure that we clean, shake the hay a little bit, and then we offer them something to eat. Uh, we do also, when we breed them, we select a male and a female. We come up with a list at the beginning of the year and, tr and pair everybody off. We pair, um, we try to get a nice variety. If you notice, we have cage labels, and we have the number of the rabbit. Males, we have a uh, green card, and females, we have a, a pink card. And we also label where that they are originally from. So this guy's from Western Connecticut. And we do try to uh, take that into consideration when we're pairing them up. We'll try to, we do it both ways. We try to make it a little diverse. We'll pick a female from Maine and a male from Connecticut, just so we know that they're genetically diverse. Uh, we keep records of who is paired with who and when, so that way we're not overbreeding one more than the other, and we're not pairing the same rabbits together over and over and over again. So we do keep fairly extensive records on these guys. I love animals, can't get enough of them. And uh, this pr project is particularly rewarding because we do help with this conservation project. These guys are there's not very many left in the wild. So it's kind of nice to be part of a project where we are doing something for the environment. We are breeding them and releasing them out into the wild and trying to help with that wild population. Okay, so at, um, here at Ninigrit National Wildlife Refuge where we've had, um, which is the top ranked property in Rhode Island for New England Cottontail based on a model that was um, done by Steve Fuller from the Wildlife Management Institute. Um, it's also the site where we built the um, New England Cottontail Acclimation Pen as part of the captive breeding and release program. Um, and it's also um, one of the more recent 
uh, places where we've documented the presence of New England cottontail in Rhode Island. So in 2005, we had a positive um, occurrence here. Um, since then, we've only found it in um, three other locations. Well, as part of the regional conservation strategy, uh, one of the objectives was to develop a captive breeding program um, where we could uh, produce rabbits that were of a high genetic diversity and that could be eventually released to sites where New England cottontails once existed or to supplement existing populations that were low. Um, part of that process was um, to create an acclimation pen that could be um, an area where young rabbits that were bred in the captive facility um, were allowed to acclimate to eating wild vegetation and where they were also protected from predators um, before they were released to their uh, final site. So we've been using that pen for the past couple years as part of the uh, pilot captive breeding program. Um, we've had great success with the rabbits that have been born at the captive facility, um, allowed to acclimate in the pen and then eventually released onto Patience Island, which is the pilot release site for this project. I don't think this be the place. I just had this feeling about things. It's so cute. There's it's moss nice. on the ground. It's a little, dappled uh, sunlight. A little dappled sunlight. Plus he's right up against it. Yep. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. They're beautiful animals, spectacular Very animals. Beautiful. That one's going for it. Okay. Well, there's some very pragmatic reasons why we want to save the species. A lot of people would say, well, we've got eastern cottontails and New England cottontail look very much like easterns, and who cares? If we just have a little brown rabbit in the environment, we should be okay. And there are several reasons why we want to save the New England cottontail. Uh, a lot of people believe that a species has the right to exist on the face of the earth. And that we really as human beings, because we've caused this problem by bringing Easterns into the habitat or in some other way changing the habitat, that we've caused the decline of New England cottontail. So we have a moral responsibility to support this species and um, to try to bring it back in its natural environment. The biggest factor is, is you can't wait until things are really, really critical because, you know, at, at that point, you know, the, the, the certainty that something's going to be implemented and then it's going to be effective, you know, you, 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 you start to be less and less confident about that. If the New England cottontail becomes endangered, then it will impact human development on the landscape. So right now, as a candidate, there's no um, there's no prohibition on take. There's no responsibility for other federal agencies or or in other individuals to uh, you know prevent uh, preclude take of of, a, of the New England cottail. Once that species becomes listed, then that take prohibition comes into effect, and then there's you know, a larger amount of, of regulation, regulatory um, process that will come into play on behalf of the New England cottontail. Every time someone wants to build um, a store, a factory, some sort of development. Uh, any new highway projects, any new uh, projects that are um, considered federal projects would need to be, uh, go, go, would need to go through a consultation to indicate what the impact is on this species. So we really don't want the New England cottontail to become an endangered species and have to do environmental impact statements throughout New England every time we want to do development. 
So there's also the thought that we as human beings are living in this very complex environment. And there's an old analogy a fellow by the name of Aldo Leopold used to use. He was the first wildlife biologist. And he said it's a lot like working with your, your grandfather's old gold watch. Um, the first intelligent rule of tinkering is to save all the pieces. And so his, his argument was that we really don't know what the importance of each individual species is in the world. Not only the importance to human beings, but the importance to the ecosystem that we depend upon. So here we have this New England cottontail that's been around for thousands and thousands of years. It could be a very important species in this environment upon which we depend. So we need to save the species. Thank you.